So, when you decided to write a first play, what inspired you? Aside from the fact that 85% of everything is crap? Yeah. <laughs> um, mm. I was inspired by inspired is such an odd word. Um, a woman, a young woman had been killed in Winnipeg. Uh, women die all the time in this country mm -hmm. and are kind of unmarked. But we all knew her in the, in the community, in the Aboriginal community. And the media said that she was a prostitute. And those of us who knew her and those of us in the Aboriginal community went, like, that's bull. And so when I went, when I started thinking I should write a play, that's the thing that I, that I wanted to deal with was mm -hmm. this young woman who had been killed. And then I wrote the play and the central character was not an Aboriginal woman, but a white woman. Mm -hmm. um, and, the, and the girl who'd been killed just before her was Aboriginal, but the, the police didn't actually become engaged until a young white woman was killed. And Winnipeg and Manitoba were very challenging at that time. I mean, we just had uh, the J.J. Harper case where J.J. Harper was on his way home from the bar, was stopped by cops. He ended up dead. They said that he'd gone for the gun. It was just, it was a terrible, a terrible incident that was eventually exposed because of Gordon Sinclair, who was a white columnist at the Winnipeg Free Press. And so there was, for me, very much that story of like, our story being told by the mainstream or disappeared. Those are kind of our options. And our story being, and that happens in theater all the time, right? Like our story being told and in movies and in, in the popular culture, our stories being told by the mainstream and our voice taken out, or our stories being disappeared unless the mainstream takes an interest in it. Yeah. I... <laughs> It's something that happens, of course, within the African Canadian community as well. And uh, um, it's funny, though. I I, I think that um, over the years, within the African Canadian community, I mean, there's been a lot of discussion about racism about uh, uh, stuff. But when I was able to uh, speak to and 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 talk to First Nations communities within, within Winnipeg, I was astonished. I was blown away by the amount of vitriol and hatred and what because I think you know what the difference is I think and I, and I think it's important there was a point in time during uh, after the war of 1812 and America uh, Canada decided that it was going to harbor slaves and it was going to you know take in black people and treat them with respect and treat them like human beings and I think within the consciousness of being Canadian there's something about if you have a darker skin uh, uh, you're at this level okay but if you're First Nations you're down here and treated quite oh I mean, yeah Winnipeg growing up in Winnipeg what were can you talk about some of the experiences you had or? oh I, endlessly I mean Winnipeg my eventually my mother had to leave Winnipeg because she just couldn't she was just so tired by the racism she worked in um human rights and education and things like that she so she had friends from across the country she would when someone came to town she would say okay we're going to go do this and they'd go and they'd sit on a bench on portage avenue the main drag and she'd say okay what time is it let's just wait and within 10 minutes the police would be there trying to move them along right. or they'd come in and they'd be like so what's happening here tonight? And they'd be leaning in trying to smell if she'd been drinking. Mm -hmm. And and her, you know, her people who were visiting from Edmonton or Calgary or Toronto or Vancouver or whatever would be like, oh my God, it's that, it's that blatant. Mm -hmm. I mean, because I look the way I look, and because my mother and I were such friends, and we would, you know, we would be going shopping or whatever. From a very young age, I became aware that. We were always being followed by the store dick. Right. And I would, at some point, I got uppity enough to sort of turn around and go, look, she's with me. I'm not going to let her steal anything. <laughs> okay? When shopping at that very famous store with the, <laughs> with the stripes on their bag, mm -hmm. the one who's been here for several hundred years. Thing in the bag? Yeah. Okay. At one point, um, we were both buying something. She had found this silk shirt on sale. We were both buying something, and I was 
in front of her. And I so I paid for my thing and they put my, my purchase in the plastic bag with the white bars mm -hmm. and I stepped aside and then she paid for her silk shirt. And the woman dug in, around underneath until she came up with a brown paper bag that had been used and put my mother's shirt in it and then stapled it shut and handed it to her. And I was like, and my mother was just like, she, you know, pick your battles, right? She's like, mm -hmm. I can't fight everything all the time. And I was, <laughs> but I was livid. Mm -hmm. I was like, why are you doing that? Like what, like we had just bought, and of course they had no idea so often that I was with her mm -hmm. because to them I, I looked white and she looked Indian and in spite of the, the resemblance, like now I see my face and I look just like my mother. Like mm -hmm. I look so much like my mother mm -hmm. that I'm surprised that people didn't just see that. But anyway, people mm -hmm. see different things. Of course. Okay, so this obviously played a role in the choice you made for your first play. It, part, it must have been part of the fuel for what you wanted to communicate. Sure, and I didn't, I didn't know what I was writing about. Mm -hmm. I've been blessed with um, really great dramaturges and... Who was the first dramaturge you used? Lori Lamb, okay. um, at, who is now at the Manitoba Theatre Center is like an associate artistic producer or something. She has a big title, mm -hmm. but she was my first dramaturge and she let me get away with murder in the play mm -hmm. because she's like, I thought you knew, you know, you knew what the rules were and you were breaking them. So mm -hmm. she let me get away with like dramaturgically murder in the play. Mm -hmm. um, but I've been blessed with great dramaturges and great, and then being recognized by the academics mm -hmm. who started to talk about the work. And then I began to understand what, was going on. So I wrote Blade, my first play, without knowing what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And Lori Lamb fed back to me and we mm -hmm. made the play that we made. But it wasn't until I read the academic work on it that said, that, you know, deconstructed it, unpacked it and talked mm -hmm. about, you know, the, the Aboriginal story being carried within the white story mm -hmm. and, you know, did all of that work that you can't do as a playwright while you're writing. No, you can't. Right? No. Like you have to just write what you write yeah, and let yeah. someone else tell you, either your dramaturge or the academics, tell you what it is you've done. Mm -hmm. um, so that was great. I didn't know that I wasn't writing a native story because I'm native, mm -hmm. right? So I didn't know. And then we got invited to Women in View Festival in Vancouver and we took the production there. And those people were really angry because they had come to see a native woman killed. And the, the central role is of Angela was being played by Maria Lamont, who's very white. Mm -hmm. And the and is the the role is white. Mm -hmm. um, but they were upset because they, they wanted to see They came to see an Aboriginal I was supposed to be the voice of my people. Someone mm -hmm. actually said that in the in the question and answer afterwards. Don't you mm -hmm. feel a responsibility to be the voice of your people? Mm -hmm. And I was like these are my people, like mm -hmm. women are my people and, you know, half breeds are my people and white folks are my people. Like all of these people are my people. But you also have a responsibility to tell the story that is inside of you, right? Otherwise, yeah. Like, what are you, like, what are you telling? Mm -hmm. I, because I, I told you before, I get this criticism sometimes where, you know, I'll write something, but I don't have enough of the pain, of the suffering. What has happened to our people? <laughs> and I kind of want to go. I, I, like I said this to you. It feels like they want to see porn. They want to see like slave porn. They want to see, you know. So where is the white man kicking the black man? I gotta see that. I gotta see his face as the boot sort of crushes his cheek. I gotta see. It's like well, why? Well, yeah. Like I'm telling you a story, and if you just listen to that story, then you'll perceive what it is I'm trying to communicate. And we can do it to ourselves. Like That's yeah, true. residential school porn for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, yeah. and we can do it to ourselves. Our own communities can do it because we are mm -hmm. all in the process of healing and mm -hmm. evolving. Some of us are just like, no, you have to show the hurt. Mm -hmm. This is not valid unless you, unless you show how badly we've been treated. Mm -hmm. And we have to heal. We have to move on. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that those stories are still valid, but... We can't always tell that same story over and over again, and especially if we're going to continue to evolve as artists, yeah. we have to keep telling different stories. There's other stories yeah. to be told. And ultimately the audience wants you, the essence of your creative engine. That's what they want. You, you, and you just be yourself as an artist and then 
you know. I mean, I, I think, would you want the Beatles to constantly play She Loves You? Love Me Do, yeah. 